Hello and welcome to this course on the Victorian short story. In this week, we'll be looking at Arthur Conan Doyle's The Red-Headed League. It's a very famous short story by Doyle. In fact, Doyle himself ranks it as his second best story. I want to begin uh, this session by giving you an interesting perspective by Harold Orell in his book, The Victorian Short Story. And this book was published in 1986. He says that uh, the 19th century British short stories are astonishingly honest and dry eyed in their examination of human problems that all too easily might have been treated sentimentally or with condescension. They impress us by the economy of means in them, in the questions of why things happen as they do and why people behave as they do remain unanswered. So this is a very interesting take on the British short fiction. And British short fiction, especially in the 19th century, can be treated sentimentally or condescendingly. And but in fact, uh, they have an honest and very, very dry eyed way of looking at things. And despite this honesty and integrity with which they deal with real life within the world of fiction, the motives as to why people um, behave the way they do and why people, why things happen the way they uh, do happen remain unanswered. So the motives are not clearly um, uh, examined in 19th century short fiction, even though there is a reality to it, even though there is a nitty gritty way of examining life. So in this particular session, we are going to look at a very uh, clear cut deductive fiction by, uh, by Arthur Conan Doyle and it features this very famous detective called Sherlock Holmes. And um, as you read the story, you will know that the real uh, slice of London is kind of portrayed uh, in a very forthright manner in this short story. So uh, there is an honesty and dried eyed aspect to the red headed league that is there, but um, things become complex uh, when we come to the motive of the people's behavior. It is not as straightforward as other aspects uh, of the story. Now, The Red-Headed League is a story which was published in 1891 in the magazine called The Strand Magazine. The story was very popular in its day and now and um, when it was first published, the illustrations to the story were done by Sidney Paget and I do have a set of illustrations that he did for this particular story and I will share uh, them with you at some point uh, well, in this particular session. And and what is interesting about this uh, red headed league narrative is its structure. It has a very interesting structure. The way the uh, mystery plot, the detective plot is woven in the story is uh, done brilliantly by Arthur Conan Doyle, which is why I have chosen this particular story to examine it in uh, relation to this short story course. Now, I have an image uh, by some of the fans of Sherlock Holmes fiction and as you can see in that image, uh, this story is ranked um, number second by Conan Doyle himself and by uh, Sherlock um, Surveys, um, Sherlockian Surveys and um, the most important aspects of the story are also mentioned here. The client's name is Jabez Wilson and uh, it was publi first published in 1892 as part of a collection called The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. and. Um, in that collection too, it appears um, in, the, in the second place. So there is a lot of association with the second in terms of the Red Headed League and this is just a, uh, a very interesting cultural facet of the story that I wanted to uh, share with you. And um, Sherlock as you know has a massive uh, fan following and uh, in the contemporary period it has um, reached a, a, a kind of a, a contemporary popularity that is unparalleled in the history of literature. And and um, the BBC Sherlock series has something to do with that kind of uh, popularization of the uh, Sherlock narrative. <coughs> Now, in the story, um, 
Sherlock um, talks to Watson and reminds the readers that it is Watson who is chronicling his adventures. So, in the Red Headed League at the beginning of the story we have uh, Sherlock um, mentioning that I know my dear Watson that you share my love of all that is bizarre and outside the conventions and humdrum routine of everyday life. You have shown your relish for it by the enthusiasm which has prompted you to chronicle and if you will excuse my saying so somewhat to embellish so many of my little adventures. So, this quip comment by uh, Holmes takes place at the beginning of the Red Headed League story and he reminds the readers that uh, Watson his friend and companion and partner in uh, detection is also the chronicler the person who records the adventures in um, written narratives and it is very interesting that Holmes uses this word chronicle, chronicle is usually associated with history writing. So, somehow the adventures of Holmes are transforming into a, a, a narrative of history, a history of London and its crimes and uh, as you can see that Holmes is accruing a lot of importance to the work that he is doing uh, as part of everyday routine, as part of the everyday humdrum uh, of ordinary existence. And he also mentions that um, Watson is not just purely recording um, the adventures, he is also embellishing it. Embellishing uh, means that he is um, you know uh, making it uh, very attractive, he is improving on it, he is polishing the story uh, in order to make it um, very entertaining and palatable to the readers. So, we have the biographer of Holmes right next to him in the figure of Watson. So, I want to go back to um, the earlier point about um, 19th century British short stories where there is a kind of a, a very realistic uh, uh, you know uh, rendering of life itself and uh, and compare it to this uh, point about um, Sherlock Holmes about how Watson is improving on. reality. So, there is a, a contrast between reality and embellishing of it in the account of Watson. Now, the story begins with this figure called Jabez Wilson with whom Holmes is having a conversation and Jabez Wilson is very important to the story because he is the one who is um, pushing the narrative into happening, he is setting the ball rolling in the story and what kind of a figure is um, influential in the story is what is um, exciting us at this point and um, this is the description of Jabez Wilson. As I said he is crucial for the narrative. because he is responsible for the narrative to come into being and what sort of this uh, person is what is revealed in this particular description. Our visitor bore every mark of being an average commonplace British tradesman, obese, pompous and slow. He wore rather baggy grey shepherd's check trousers and not over clean black frock coat unbuttoned in the front and a drab waistcoat with a heavy brassy albert chain and a square pierced bit of metal dangling down as an ornament. There, has, there are a lot of details in this uh, description, but what is coming through for me here is the drabness, the dullness, the grey aspect of Jabez O. Wilson and his average quality, his commonplace. Look at the word commonplace, very ordinary. 
and his outfit is not that of a gentleman's it's baggy it's gray and it's not clean it's not overly clean and it's very drab so we do get a sense that Jabez Wilson is a ordinary British tradesman who is not very exciting who is not very interesting who is not very extraordinary and we got to remember that um, Sherlock Holmes is a figure who thinks that extraordinary things can be hidden under commonplace exteriors. So, this figure is uh, exciting in an ordinary way. Now, what happens in the story is that Jabez Wilson um, is made to work in a place and the work involves just copying out pages of Encyclopedia Britannica for four, 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 four pounds a week. So, that is his job and it is a very, very interesting job because this job is uh, won by him uh, in uh, an answer to an advertisement which says that only red headed uh, persons can apply um, towards this uh, advertisement and they would get uh, a good sum of money for a very nominal um, piece of work um, uh, on a weekly basis. So, Jabez uh, Wilson responds to this advertisement and he gets the job and he starts copying out Encyclopedia Britannica uh, during the morning hours and he is paid 4 pounds a week. And, uh, uh, he was um, brought to the attention of the advertisement by his assistant called Vincent Spaulding. And Vincent Spaulding is very interesting because he is working for half wages in Jabez Wilson's pound broker's business. And um, Jabez Wilson gives us a description of the kind of figure that Vincent Spaulding is. So, he says that his name is Winston Spaulding and he is not such a youth either, it is hard to say his age, I should not wish a smarter assistant Mr. Holmes and I know very well that he could better himself and earn twice what I am able to give him, but after all if he is satisfied why should I put ideas in his head. So, Winston Spaulding is interesting because he is an excellent assistant and he is working for half wages at Jabez Wilson's pawnbroker's business and he is the one who as I said brings um, to the attention of Jabez Wilson this advertisement about um, you know the red headed league um, demanding a, a, a new red headed person to take up this particular job uh, for a, a hefty sum of money on a weekly basis. So, uh, he is an extremely smart person and he is not young, but um, at the same time it is it's, it's very difficult to um, you know come to a decision about his age. And this set of ideas about Winston Spaulding is very interesting in retrospect, because once you have read the story and once you know the resolution to the story, you might want to you know go back on your tracks and try to understand the man who is one of the key antagonists in this particular story. So, uh, you know the nature of crime and um, you know and uh, which is embedded in a figure uh, of indeterminate age becomes interesting um, in retrospect. Now, we get further questions um, from uh, Sherlock Holmes about uh, Winston Spaulding and uh, Jabez Wilson offers further details. He says that he is small, stout built, very quick in his ways, no hair on his face, though he is not short of 30, has a white splash of acid upon his forehead. Once again, a very um, you know fascinating um, set of details about Winston Spaulding and um, this is fascinating because he is the master criminal in this particular story and you want to know uh, how this criminal appears physically and um, he is small the reference to the smallness of Winston Spaulding as well as his accomplice is uh, exciting. Um, and, and, and we also need to know that he is also very quick um, in his ways and if you compare these attributes with the attributes of uh, another very famous um, criminal in late 19th century fiction who is Mr. Hyde, 
you will kind of uh, come to see that there is a resemblance between smallness and quickness um, in terms of these uh, criminal figures. There seems to be a common uh, set of uh, you know attributes um, which are associated with criminals. So, that is one um, you know stereotype or uh, physical quality that um, we need to keep in mind in terms of uh, master minds or in terms of evil minded figures in literature. So, he is small and he is not yet 30 and most interestingly he has a white splash of acid upon his forehead. So, this is a very odd detail and this also very um, obviously in a very marked way uh, you know brings some kind of significance to his uh, face. A splash of acid means that he has been dabbling with chemicals or he is involved with someone who has dabbled with chemicals. So, um, the association of chemistry and this evil minded uh, figure becomes significant um, if we think about it. So, uh, should we ask this question is science associated um, with criminal masterminds as well um, in terms of late 19th century fiction. So, we also need to keep this uh, query in mind. Of course, we also know that Sherlock Holmes also dabbles with uh, chemical experiments and uh, we also know that he works for the good um, in society. At least he is involved in uh, catching criminals and putting them behind bars. But we also know that if, if uh, push comes to shove, he could also have uh, you know uh, adopted um, you know underhand means to uh, catch his criminal. So, uh, science becomes very very complex um, in, in terms of these detectives and criminals at this um, point of 19th century fiction. And once again I am um, returning to the uh, strange case of um, Dr. Jekyll and uh, Mr. Hyde where science is manipulated by Dr. Jekyll in order to transform into Hyde. So, the splash of acid becomes a distinct mark on uh, Vincent Spaulding's face. <coughs> Now, uh, I want to pay attention to the way in which uh, Holmes is trying to describe crime in society and what fascinates me is the metaphor that he uh, employs. He says that as a rule, said Holmes, the more bizarre a thing is, the less mysterious it proves to be. It is your commonplace featureless crimes which are really puzzling just as a commonplace face is the most difficult to identify. Um, it is a very interesting set of ideas. Now, I wanted to first look at the first section of this um, set of um, perspectives by Holmes. He says that the more bizarre a thing is the less mysterious it proves to be. So, if, if a thing is obviously bizarre, strange and mysterious it might prove to be a dull case. And it, um, if it is kind of commonplace, if the mystery is commonplace then its end result might be more exciting. So, that is what he is trying to establish. And um, what I would want you, um, you know students who have enrolled on this course is to apply this concept to this story red headed league and see and test if what he says is true. Is the story commonplace in the red headed league? Is the crime commonplace in the red headed league? And um, is the result very very mysterious? So, try uh, to test the proposition of Holmes. So, that is the uh, you know uh, homework for you in relation to this particular point that uh, Holmes is trying to establish. Now, Jabez Wilson has given his case to Holmes and he has um, you know uh, fascinated Holmes the great detective and therefore, um, Holmes has accepted the case and once Wilson has left what the two men do is to visit the space occupied by Jabez Wilson. 
So, this um, chunk of um, text from the story is exciting for the social canvas that we get of late 19th century London. We travelled by the underground as far as Aldous Gate and a short walk took us to Saxe Coburg Square, the scene of the singular story which we had listened to in the morning. It was a pokey, little, shabby, gentle place where four lines of dingy two-storied big brick houses looked out into a small railed-in enclosure where a lawn of weedy grass and a few clumps of faded laurel bushes made a hard fight against a smoke-laden and uncongenial atmosphere. Three gilt walls and a brown board with Jabez Wilson in white letters upon a corner house announced the place where our red-headed client carried on his business. So, Watson and Holmes visit the place of business of Jabez Wilson and the setting of Jabez Wilson's business is very interesting for us. Look at the description, it is a dingy two-story brick house and a lot of weedy grass, not very healthy grass and a few clumps of faded laurel bushes. It is not very bright, it is faded and it is in a smoke laden and uncongenial atmosphere. And three gilt balls and a brown board, gilt very uh, flashily ornamental, ornamental in a fake way, in a flimsy way and a brown board, not in a very uh, attractive colour, it is in a brown board with Jabez Wilson in white letters. So, the ambience of this place of business is not very attractive, it is dull, it is dingy, it is in an uncongenial, unhealthy atmosphere and this is where Jabez Wilson uh, works. The point of this description is to tell us that Jabez Wilson is a shabby genteel figure, he is not part of the gentlemanly middle class. In fact, if you look at the early sections of the story, uh, it is made very clear that Jabez Wilson had done manual labour which means that he is not part of the uh, middle classes or the upper classes and then he has even uh, been a ship's carpenter. So, from that position he has um, risen to the state of a small time uh, tradesman. So, um, this class position of Jabez Wilson is consciously established by the red headed league story and um, the physical setting of Jabez Wilson's uh, business is um, oriented in such a way that we consciously understand his place in society and uh, the natural uh, elements surrounding his uh, place of work such as the grass and the laurel bushes are also equally dingy and dull and it is all of one piece and just as um, you know uh, the clothing or the outfit of Jabez Wilson also establish the uh, class position and the character of uh, this particular small time trader. Now, once we have been introduced to the place of business in a particular manner, the narrator of the story takes us to a different um, setting in order to uh, suggest the contrast that are there in the city of London. So, um, this particular journey that Watson and Holmes undertake after visiting the place of business of Jabez Wilson is also significant to understand um, widely differing pockets of life in this urban uh, environment of London. The road in which we found ourselves as we turned round the corner from the retired Saxe Coburg Square presented as great a contrast to it as the front of a picture does to the back. 
It was one of the main arteries which conveyed the traffic of the city to the north and west. The roadway was blocked with the immense stream of commerce flowing in a double tide inward and outward, while the footpaths were black with the hurrying swarm of pedestrians. It was difficult to realize as we looked at the line of fine shops and stately business premises that they really abutted on the other side upon the faded and stagnant square which we had just quitted. So when you read the story, we are conscious of the fact that this is a different side to London. In fact, we can uh, see in the description that the narrator is conscious to point out that difference. Look at the comparison here. The retired Sax uh, Kubrick Squire presented as great a contrast to it as the front of a picture does to the back. So, as soon as they turn the corner from where Jabez Wilson has his business, they reach a neighborhood which is completely different from the front to the back of a picture. So, that is the kind of difference that we get when we move to this side of uh, London. And um, the narrator says, uh, Watson says that it was one of the main arteries which conveyed the traffic of the city to the north and west. And uh, the following description about the double tide of people moving inward and outward also reminds us of the inward moving and the outward going uh, traffic of red headed men who answer the call um, to that particular advertisement by the red headed league uh, which wants a person to occupy a vacancy uh, for um, a very nominal work on a weekly basis. So, we see echoes of um, one setting or the another in this particular story and there are uh, symbolic and ideological significances connected to this echoing of settings um, at different points in the story. And uh, uh, he says that it was difficult to realize as we looked at the line of fine shops and stately business that they really abetted on the other side upon the faded and stagnant square. And this faded and stagnant square is the one in which we have Jabez Wilson's uh, pawnbroker's business. So, on the one side we have a very drab neighborhood which is dull and dingy and unhealthy. On, on the other side, um, you know, we have a fine line of uh, shops and stately business uh, and, and um, some of the stately businesses include a big um, you know a bank as well. Now, um, it is very easy to you know uh, kind of follow Holmes's deduction um, because it is almost plain that something really untoward is uh, going to happen uh, in terms of the um, activities of the assistant of Jabez Wilson. So, when we are told by Holmes that there is going to be a big bank robbery and that uh, Jabez Wilson's assistant called Winston Spaulding who is in fact the big criminal mastermind John Clay uh, who is trying to dig a tunnel from um, the pawnbroker's shop from the seller of the pawnbroker's shop to the um, city bank um, and um, rob the bank of a big sum of money. It is not a massive surprise to the readers. So, we, we are somehow and trying to we, we have somehow kind of followed the instincts of um, Sherlock Holmes, but what is the surprise is uh, the fact that it he is going to catch him in the act, he is going to stop the crime in the act and the key criminal mastermind is an interesting figure in Holmes assessment. He says that um, John Clay he is in fact a murderer, he is a thief, a smasher and forger, he is a young man Mr. Merriweather, but he is at the head of his profession and I would rather have my bracelets on him than on any criminal in London. He is a remarkable man is young John Clay, his grandfather was a royal duke and he himself has been to Eton and Oxford. His brain is as cunning as his fingers and though we meet signs of him at every turn, we never know where to find the man himself. 
So the man called Winston Spaulding, who is working for half wages at Jabez Wilson's pawnbroker's business, is in fact a murderer, a thief, a smasher of property, and a forger of documents. And he has hatched this plan uh, to rob the uh, bank, which is on the other side of the street, by digging a tunnel from um, Jabez Wilson's cellar and um, homes kind of uh, detects this plan and um, he is waiting with his uh, set of um, you know uh, friends and um, fr and his friends from the police as well at the uh, cellar of the bank and he's waiting to catch um, this uh, murderer and thief but what is interesting about John Clay is not that he is a criminal but his background and uh, that's what is exciting in fact he is um, of noble blood. His grandfather was a royal duke and he himself has been to Eton and Oxford to um, institutions of higher learning, to elite institutions of higher learn learning. And um, he says that his brain is as cunning as his fingers. So just as he is agile physically, his brain is also agile mentally. And um, Holmes says that he is on the verge of catching him at um, every point, but then he escapes uh, him in the past. So uh, he's always around the corner uh, for uh, Holmes. And at this point in the story, at this uh, stage in his life, he thinks that he is going to catch him. Thank you for watching, and uh, I'll continue in the next session.